Ronnie. Take your hand off your horn. Oh, for <laughs> sake. Good. Now, Ronnie's expressed his frustration that he would prefer to be surfing than stuck in the room with us. Valid feeling, Ronnie. But today, let me show you how to wave it off for a rad ride. Four fingers and a posable thumb. A gift from evolution to achieve an outcome. Without a single word, we can communicate with these. Welcome, stop, sorry and please. Would you drop in on your best mate set? Tailgating is as rude as it gets. Mate, relax, shake off the aggro. Ride the road, wave and go with the flow. Let it go, it's alright. It's not worth the beeping fight. Would you lock her out from the coffee shop? All that I wanted was a wheatgrass shot. She needs your help, her lane's about to end. Let her in and make a new friend. Would you stand that close if you were taking a pee? Sharing the road is a liberty. Leave at least a metre a personal space. Share a roadway and keep yourself safe. Let it go, it's all right. It's not worth the bleeping fine. Would you take on Granny in an obstacle race? Well, that's kind of what you're doing when you steal my car space. You're a good person, don't be greedy. Share a roadway with those more needy. Would you throw a tantrum in a public place? At your age, Mum, that's a disgrace. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, social marketers around the world. How are you tonight? Hope you're well. My name is Wynn Morgan, and as president of the International Social Marketing Association, it's both my privilege and pleasure to introduce the 20th in a series of webinars designed to advance social marketing teaching research and practice. We have Ross Gordon with us today. Ross, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Wynn. Thank you. Good, and we have Jay Kassira today. How are you, Jay? I'm well, too. Welcome, everyone. Good. He's our organizer of the webinar series and the chair of our ISMA membership committee of our board of directors. So we'll begin in just a minute, but before we do, I'd like to share a couple of timely updates. Uh, provided through the International Social Marketing Association. So first of all, the important thing is to mark your calendars because if you don't know already, Washington, D.C. in May uh, 16th and 17th, 2017, we're going to have the World Social Marketing Conference, and I hope we're going to see all of you there. Now, there's a call for paper out, and that... Uh, that goes through, I think, mid-September. Isn't that right, Jay? Um, actually, I looked at that. It's the 7th, 7th of 7th September. 7th of September. Yeah. So time, so time to get your, your paper abstracts in. You can go to wsmconference.com uh, forward slash Washington, D.C. 2017 forward slash call for papers. Or better yet, just go to wsmconference.com and then click on the call for papers in the menu there. Okay, we've also got, if you're, if you're going to be in Finland or in Europe in September, remember we've got coming up the European Social Marketing Conference. That's 22nd to 23rd September 2016. Now we hope to see you there. Now we've got a lot of events that are coming up, and so all you have to do is go to the ISMA website, Check out our event calendar and look at all the great things that are happening. We have discounts, many discounts for ISMA members, such as for the 2017 meeting. So make sure you go on, log on to your website, and make sure that you can get the discount codes for those. But uh, don't let me keep you from Ross Gordon and Jay. They're going to have an excellent webinar today. And so I'd like to turn it over to you, Jay, without further ado. Jay? Thank you, Wynn. And um, so I'd like to uh, remind everyone that if you've got more than one person at your location, could you let us know how many people you have? If there's just one, we'll assume uh, you're one. But otherwise, we don't know how many people. We just know how many connections. So uh, please do let us know about that. Also, in terms of uh, questions, 
please enter them as they come to you using the chat box. Any unanswered ones will be answered uh, at the end uh, of the uh, the once Ross stops his presentation in roughly the same order that they came in. So um, make your place there by asking your question as it comes to you. Um, let's see. How did you learn about this webinar? There's well, some of you that I don't know yet, so maybe we could ask people to let us know how you found out about the webinar, please. Go ahead and click um, whichever one is right for you. <clears throat> okay, so mostly through our emails, but we have um, at least one group that uh, got it through uh, through a colleague. Great to see. And then it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Ross Gordon, who is an associate professor of marketing at, and is it Macquarie or Macari, Ross? Macquarie. 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 Okay, thank yes. you. Macquarie University you. in Sydney. His work focuses on social yes. issues and social change through a critical, reflexive, and multi-perspective lens. Ross is the president of the Australian Association of Social Marketing, AASM. He's also currently a visiting research fellow in social marketing at the Open University, a visiting academic at London School of Economics and Political Science, and an honorary senior fellow at the University of Wollongong Faculty of Social Science. Um, he has co-authored a leading textbook on social marketing and social change with Jeff French, in 2015 called Strategic Social Marketing. And he's a keen player and follower of sports, including playing football for Macquarie University, um, some tennis and cycling. He loves traveling, enjoys current affairs, and is a big music fan and occasional techno DJ. Ross, over to you. Thanks, and good morning, everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here uh, today to talk to you a bit about um, a project I've been working on for the past three years um, on the topic of energy efficiency. Uh, and what I'm going to be presenting to you today is how we used storytelling and essentially created narrative videos to, to promote health, well-being and energy efficiency among low-income older people. So I'd like to start off by asking a question, I guess, of you know, what do people think makes a good story? So if you think of a story that you really like, you know, something like Cinderella or Jack and the Beanstalk, stories that you're familiar with growing up, and can you think what were the key elements that made that story really good? Um, was it the characters? Was it the plot? Was it certain events in the story? Was it how the story ended? Um, and how would you tell a story to try and influence people? If we are thinking about storytelling for behaviour change, these are important questions that we must know the answers to. So this presentation will focus on storytelling and social marketing and social change and hopefully demonstrate that this can be a promising approach in our area. So what I'm going to talk about today, first of all, we'll introduce a little bit about the background of the, the energy project we've been working on, which is called Energy Plus Illawarra. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about the power and potential of storytelling for social change. Um, I'll then describe the method that we took to actually use storytelling to influence energy efficiency behaviours. And to do that, I will illustrate and, and respond to three key questions about our storytelling videos. First of all, how was the narrative made? Secondly, who tells the narrative? And lastly, where was the narrative? Where was the story told? Um, and then I'll briefly finish off with some key implications from this presentation and from our use of storytelling in this project. And then hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers. So basically the background to this presentation is that we use storytelling as part of an overall social marketing project 
called Energy Plus Illawarra. Um, and that was essentially a community energy efficiency programme that was run in New South Wales in Australia. Um, it was part of a nationally competitive grant funded by the Australian government, and it involved multiple project partners, including the university, um, the regional development agency, a range of aged care providers, and also community and social organisations. Uh, and what was interesting about this project is, was that it drew upon multidisciplinary perspectives, including social marketers, human geographers, and engineers. And the aim and objectives of this successful project were to develop, deliver, and evaluate a comprehensive social marketing program with the aim of facilitating energy efficiency and also comfort and well-being in the home of low-income older residents of the Illawarra, New South Wales. The project also made extensive use of, of research, just like any good social marketing project should do. So that included baseline and follow-up survey evaluation, extensive formative research with participants and stakeholders, ethnographic research in people's homes, and an extensive social marketing program, which also included retrofits in people's homes. So a bit of the background about why we've concentrated on energy um, efficiency is that energy and thermal comfort are important factors that are not just related to saving the environment and reducing um, energy use, but are also related to comfort, health and well-being. For example, the World Health Organization identifies that there's a minimum temperature benchmark of 18 degrees Celsius that is comfortable for human beings to live in with recommended increases of 2 to 3 degrees Celsius above that for people who are more vulnerable to the effects of the cold, such as the elderly, who are the focus of our project here. We also know that issues of energy efficiency, rising fuel costs, and also fuel poverty can cause low-income older people, who are our target audience here, to use little energy to maintain thermal comfort and can lead to them being too cold in winter and too warm in summer. And that's a really important issue of concern because we know from extensive research that cold exposure among older people in winter is linked with increased mortality rates. And also heat stress in summer is also linked with increased mortality among older people. So although our focus is on energy efficiency, health and comfort and well-being are very important as well. A bit more of the background about our project, the Energy Plus Illawarra program does make extensive use of theory um, as recommended for any good social marketing project. So in this program, we combine perspectives from social practice theory, which I will return to in a second, social ecological theory, and also value theory. And a couple of examples of how we used those theoretical frameworks are baseline survey segmentation um, used value theory to identify different audience segments based on their perceptions towards energy efficiency. And from that segmentation analysis, we then developed and delivered the social marketing program to these different segments accordingly. Also, our formative focus group research and home ethnographies were used to gain understanding of people's energy use practices, and we drew extensively on social practice theory perspectives to do that. And our social marketing intervention, um, this social marketing mix that we used, was developed drawing upon a broad range of techniques, tools, and strategies. So in a sense, taking a social ecological approach to behavior change. So this uh, slide here shows some of the intervention activities that we used in the Energy Plus Illawarra project. So quite a broad range of intervention, such as energy efficiency retrofits to people's homes, to energy efficiency products, to community training, media and stakeholder advocacy, website and social media, and so on. However, today, what I would like to focus on is our use of narrative videos and harnessing the power of storytelling to influence energy efficiency behaviors. So as already mentioned, in this project, we were interested in using social practice theory to help understand people's energy use practices. So if you're not familiar with this area, social practice theory refers to a broad paradigm of approaches to understanding everyday social practices from a cultural theory perspective. 
So social practices refer to everyday or regular habits or practices, things like consuming food or using energy in the home, and the way that people typically and habitually perform these practices. Now, researchers in this area, such as Andreas Reckwitz, theorise that practice is composed of different elements, such as how we use our body and our minds, how we use materials, how we use language and knowledge, and what we do in spaces and places. And we use these different elements to routinely perform the practice. So essentially, social practice theory treats this abstract concept of practices as the key unit of analysis. So here, we're interested in what do people do and how do they use energy? So the primary focus is on that rather than the performers of the practices. Now, we know from research in this area that language, discourse and narratives are key elements of practice. The way that we talk about how we do things, the way that we, we describe how we do things is very important. So Analyze the Discourse of Actors offers a useful access point for exploring and analysing social practices such as energy use. So our focus here is on the role and power of narratives as a way of acknowledging and also influencing people's social practices of energy use. So that draws into the, the considering the power of storytelling. So if we look at the idea of storytelling, stories are something that are central to human life. We grow up with stories. They are all around us when we are young. And we often learn about social life and about standards of behaviour and about how the way the world works through hearing, telling and listening to stories. So stories act as a transmitter of social cultural ideas, norms and structures. And Barthes has identified that there is always narrative. No matter where you are in the world, all humans, all groups and all cultures do have their stories. And stories have got power. They teach in multiple ways because they can involve us in personal and emotional sense, which is quite different from how we respond to things like facts and statistics. So this emotional power of stories can be often the key to igniting action. Taking example, the use of metaphors and analogies in stories can often help bridge the emotional and cognitive meaning of a story. So using an analogy can often help people understand what the punchline and the takeaway knowledge is from seeing a story. So stories allow us to stimulate and learn from events without necessarily having to live through the experience. So again, I'll use the example of Adam and Eve. When Adam eats the apple, we learn from hearing that story of what the implications are from performing a bad behaviour without actually having to go and do that behaviour ourselves. So as we are growing up, so stories often set the boundaries for us and what we should be doing. Also, storytelling can take complex ideas and often make them simpler and actionable. And that's really important because if we think about a lot of health or social messages, they often utilise numbers such as percentages or technical language and uncommon words that may not be familiar to people. So for, certainly for people with limited numeracy and literacy skills, storytelling may be a useful option to communicate ideas about behaviour change. And that's an idea that's backed up by people working in the storytelling area. So Nancy Mellon, for example, who wrote The Art of Storytelling, argues that there's a natural storytelling urge and ability in all human beings. And even just harnessing a little bit of that promise can bring about important and, and um, impactful results. So narrative can be an important way for understanding, interpreting and representing what people are saying about social issues. And narrative is now starting to be used in the social change arena. A couple of examples, Baranowski and colleagues um, conducted a review to look at how video games have used stories to influence health behaviour change among young adults. Um, and Stead et al. have looked at how st children's storybooks can be used to promote active living in a local community. So already people have started to look at this idea of social change and using storytelling in this area. So if we want to use stories in social marketing and social change, we need to understand 
how do we put a story together? And that is where the ideas from narrative transportation theory come in very useful. So narrative transportation is an idea that when people essentially lose themselves in a story, their attitudes and their behavioral intentions will often change to reflect the story. So researchers Thomas Van Laar and colleagues recently conducted a meta-analysis of this narrative transportation literature and have provided some welcome clarity to how narratives might be used to change everyday practices. And in that work, they proposed three key elements for narratives in what they called the extended transportation imagery model that relate to what the storyteller should be doing. First of all, that argues that you should create identifiable characters. Secondly, creating an imaginable plot. And third, creating a sense of verisimilitude. So this diagram here explains Van Laar and colleagues' extended transportation imagery model. And thinking as a social marketer, what we have the most influence over is what the storyteller is doing. So that, therefore, that, that would argue that we need to make sure we have identifiable characters, an imaginable plot, and create a sense of verisimilitude. So to understand what these three elements are, I'll briefly explain these. First of all, identifiable characters. So that relates to how storytellers use narrative framing to refer to the characters in any story. And what is really important here is that storytellers need to be clear about whom they are talking about and make sure that they formulate characters according to identifiable characteristics. Because what that does, it can aid the story receiver's identification with and empathy for those characters. So it's really important to ensure that story receivers can understand the experience of the characters and know and feel the world in a similar way. So they've got some relatability to the people that are experiencing the story. And what is argued is that narrative transportation will happen as receivers vicariously experience the beliefs and emotions of the story characters. So essentially they begin to empathize with them as they become engrossed in the story. They start to feel for them, they start to feel some sense of connection with them. Secondly, an imaginable plot is very important in any storytelling. Because an imaginable plot requires that the storytelling is articulated clearly and believably so that narrative transportation can occur. And if we think about any story, there's a temporal sequence of events that happen to the characters in any given setting. And that needs to happen in a way that is imaginable and believable by audiences. So we think about any story that we're familiar with, they generally have a beginning, they have a middle, and they have an end. They have a certain structure. And what is argued is that if the story plot is imaginable in people's minds, they can identify with it and make connections to their own real life experiences, therefore entering the narrative world. So essentially an imaginable story plot can influence narrative transportation by helping people imagine it could really be them experiencing what story characters are experiencing. So that is very important in how you put the plot together in a story. Lastly, Van Laar and colleagues argue that verisimilitude is very important in stories. And that is essentially what may be termed lifelikeness. So Van Laar defines verisimilitude as the likelihood that story events may actually happen. You know, are they believable enough that this could happen in real life? And Brunner identifies that people evaluate stories in relation to this verisimilitude. However, an important point here is that Baal et al. argue that the crucial focus in verisimilitude is on believability and not necessarily on consistency and contradictions. That means that elements of fiction in terms of invented events and stories or even issues with continuity are not so critical. That's okay to do that, provided the story is still believable enough. Lastly, in our project, we also thought that it's important to acknowledge that every story happens somewhere and all practices occur in spaces and places. So our extension to these ideas from narrative transportation theory were to acknowledge situated knowledge. So that, that means that the question of where a story are told 
is really important. And up to now, that has been given less attention in the narrative literature. That is despite research from social cultural studies suggesting the importance of situating knowledge for understanding stories. And if we think about it, practices always do occur somewhere. So there's always a setting, a time and a place of a story. And a Rick Whitsey perspective of social practices certainly does suggest that situated knowledge matters and is an important element of energy use practice. And using one example from research on energy use, work that was carried out in New South Wales on winter warming practices found that a lack of winter warming uh, practices is in part due to shared narratives of Wollongong as being a summer place. So what it means is in that, that location in Australia, there are no common stories about Wollongong in the winter and what you should do to keep warm. The common realised story there is that this is a warm summer place. We don't think and talk about what you do in winter. However, actually, Wollongong does get cold in winter, but there's no stories and common knowledge created about how you respond to that. So our method for using the power of stories in our project is what we would term collective video storytelling. And what we actually did is we drew upon some of our formative research to actually help develop our narrative videos. So we undertook 11 qualitative focus groups with low-income older people living in regional New South Wales. And that research was supplemented by ethnographic research involving home open-ended interviews and also home video tours. And in this research, we asked questions to start conversations with our participants, asking things such as how do you use energy in the home and what do you do? Or what do you think are some of the major contributors to energy use in your home. And in this research, participants were encouraged to tell and share their stories about how they use energy in their homes. And from that, we were able to generate some very deep insights about how participants' um, home energy use practices operate. So once we would collected that data, we undertook a discourse analysis to generate a series of narratives. And our focus here was on the use of language and stories to describe how people use energy at home. So here is one example of an energy narrative. And this is a particular story about how someone is using their refrigerator. Now, what you see in the screen here is not all the one story. It's actually different quotes from our formative research that we took and put all together to create a coherent story about one topic. So we did that for a series of different energy use practices. So we actually created 10 of these narratives using sto already the stories that were told to us in the focus groups and the, the ethnographic research. So we developed narratives according to um, 10 practices that are suggested as being important to our participants and which also use a high proportion of energy use in the, ho in the home. So things like using fridges, doing the laundry, using hot water, heating and cooling, and so on. And these narrative videos that we then developed were distributed on our project website, on YouTube, and also through using LCD brochures, which we distributed in the local community. So in terms of the questions of how we use storytelling in this project, I want to respond to three important questions. First of all, how was the narrative made? So our starting point was creating a series of narratives by weaving together extracts of the stories already told to us in the focus groups about different domestic energy practices. And that process of editing together individual stories enabled us to develop participant-oriented collective narratives that essentially provided a script for our various videos. Our selection of stories was guided by analysis of our participants' energy narratives. And this work identified some key concerns related to reinforcing their existing good practices, to risks and harms created by thrifty behaviour of, of the energy use, and also to addressing some myths and misunderstandings about how to be energy efficient. So taking the example of reinforcing existing practices 
our research and the stories that we were told by people um, identified that often low-income older people are already being very energy efficient. So if we want to use storytelling and we want to influence their behaviour, we also want to reinforce some of the existing things that they're doing well. So here is a screenshot from one of our videos where we have a lady using a blanket to keep warm. And that's a story that was often told to us by participants. So we wanted to reinforce that and support that existing behaviour. And as you can see, we did that in one of these videos. I also mentioned this idea of harm and risk due to being thrifty with energy use. So here is a quote from one of our participants who mentions a friend who used to use the street lights at night through the window instead of turning the lights on because they were concerned about using energy and about the cost of doing that. And as you can see, this, uh, this man had a fall in the bathroom and actually ended up in hospital. So that suggests that some of these very thrifty and energy use practices can actually cause harm to health and well-being. So we identified that it would be important to address this in the videos. So how we do this is at the start of each video, we essentially offer a redefinition of energy efficiency. If you look at the existing literature on energy, it's mostly all about cutting back and not wasting anything. But we identified that it's also important to be concerned about supporting everyday life and to be living in comfort and well-being. So our re uh, redefinition reflects that at the start of each video. I also mentioned that there were some myths and misunderstandings that emerged from our research. So a couple of examples are on the screen here. Um, one person says, I wonder about what to do with opening and closing the fridge door. So when I'm taking the milk out to make coffee, do I need to close the door or is all the energy escaping out? Um, another person here says, I have reverse cycle air conditioning, but I don't use that in the winter to heat the home because it's too expensive. So there are some misunderstandings or a lack of knowledge about what the correct uh, way of behaving is here. So we wanted to address some of these myths and misunderstandings in the videos. So here is one example of how we do that in the, the video about heating. We actually put the facts up that using a reverse cycle air conditioner is two and a half to six times more efficient than using an electric heater to warm the home. So trying to encourage people to actually do the right thing when they may have a misunderstanding. Okay, so the other questions that I wanted to address were who tells the narrative and where is the narrative told? So these key themes were integrated into our story elements following the, the knowledge from narrative transportation theory. So each narrative video was created to feature identifiable characters, an imaginable plot, create a sense of verisimilitude, and acknowledge situated knowledge. So first of all, with identifiable characters, the way that we actually did this was that each video, the narrators and characters possess identifiable characteristics that relate to our target audience of low-income older people. So the videos actually feature real project participants, their voices, their faces, their bodies, technologies, and homes. So therefore, by featuring real research participants with these demographics, this helps create identifiable characters for our low-income older viewers. So I'll just show you a quick clip from one of our videos about energy, uh, energy use and fridges that shows some of our project participants. The man told me by opening the door we disturb the air in there and probably cause most of the cold air to come out. I don't know the answer to how sufficiently open the fridge to get the milk out to put in my coffee and then I put the milk back in. Should I close the door in between so in that video clip, you can actually hear the couple talking about what to do when opening the fridge door. So that's actually a real person from our project in their own home and acting out that story. So again, that creates a sense of identifiable characters for the viewers of these narrative videos. In terms of imaginable plot, to help create an imaginable plot for viewers, 
we requested our video participants to act out everyday energy use practices. So while the narrative story is read, these practices are shown being performed on the screen and the audio of the narrative can be heard at the same time. So for example, in our laundry video, we have a woman called Jeanette doing washing uh, of the clothing at home, as she would do normally, using her own clothing, materials and technologies, such as her washing machine and laundry basket. And what that does is it creates a synergy between the narrative, the performers and the practices that they're showing. So that helps the viewer imagine the plot, making it more likely that they will enter the narrative world. In a sense, they could see themselves doing the same or similar things. So I'll now show you the video clip from the laundry video showing Jeanette acting out these practices. I also have a little clothes line inside that I use for smalls, like underwear. Sunshine comes through the window and it dries just fine. But I do like to hang most of my washing out in the sun and wind because I love the smell and knowing that I'm saving money. Okay, and in sense of creating a sense of better similitude, that was achieved again through the use of project participants and recounting the narratives situated in their homes based on the stories they had already told us. For an example, in the personal cooling video, Peter enters an air-conditioned shopping mall during hot weather. He then collects a drink and snack from a stall and sits down at a table where he meets a woman who he appears to know. The woman sits down and they appear to start talking, although their words cannot actually be heard. However, when we actually shoot the video, Peter and the woman are not actually really talking about anything. This segment is entirely acted out, because if we remember, verisimilitude just needs to make it look lifelike. It does not necessarily actually need to be real. In another example in the cooking video, a woman called Jeanette is shown apparently cooking a chicken in the oven. However, again, when we made this video, the story was acted out. So when shooting the video, we used a thawed chicken that was shown being taken out of the fridge by Jeanette, and then we actually purchased a pre-cooked barbecue chicken and show that later being taken out of the oven. So even though these segments of the story are not 100% real, the way it is shown makes it appear to be believable and lifelike, therefore creating a sense of verisimilitude. So I'll now show the video of Peter and this imagined, acted out conversation that he has. Just to escape the heat. And while you're there, you can be social, meet up with friends and get a drink or a bite to eat. You can wander around in the air conditioning and it's always nice and cool. And you have to do what you can and use what you've got to be comfortable through the hot summer and look after your own health and well-being. And if you save money too, well, that makes it well worth it. OK, and then, as I identified earlier, in our project and in making our storytelling videos, we also wanted to acknowledge spaces and places. So situated knowledge was a very important concern for us. So with the consent of our project participants, the start of each video identifies who the participants are and where they live. And the nar video narrators are located in their own home or in the local community, using their own appliances and materials, or local spaces and places that are relevant to the topic of the video, and are also relevant to the people who are watching our videos. So in a sense, situating knowledge and ignoring the spatial is important because the various practices that consume energy help us to sustain the social, emotional and sensual relations that comprise home places. We essentially make home by using energy. So again, I will show you a short clip from one of the videos showing the person's name and where they're from. So by showing a clip that identifies the person and where they are from, people in our area who are watching these videos can help identify with it. They recognise that this video is about what happens in their community and in their area. And again, here we have another excerpt from a video that shows parts of the local community where people can identify with. Earlier or later in the day, and avoid physical exertion during the hottest parts of the day, which are usually between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m.
Another way I get by is to pop into town or a shopping centre for a couple of hours. That way I'm getting out of the house and into the air conditioning. On a hot day in summer, the sh So in that clip there, it's actually a local uh, shopping mall that has been shown and that would be very identifiable to lots of our project participants because they would visit the same shopping mall and recognise that clip when they see it. So again, that creates a sense that this knowledge and these stories are situated in their local community and are therefore relevant to them. So from our use of uh, these energy efficiency narratives, we identify some important practical implications for storytelling and social change. And we would argue that it's very important for social marketers to make sure that they acknowledge the elements of social practices in stories, to make sure that they use identifiable characters, to create an imaginable plot, to generate a sense of verisimilitude, essentially lifelikeness, and to incorporate situated knowledge into every story. So our addition of situated knowledge here suggests an extension of the narrative transportation model that was developed by Van Laar and colleagues. However, it is still early days for using these storytelling ideas in such a way in social marketing. So future research across different contexts concerning different social change issues and also with different participant groups can further extend the knowledge base in this area. And what is also very important is we need to demonstrate impact from using storytelling for social change. So evaluation research on the effects of narratives will be important to demonstrate their effectiveness. But from our project, we would find, argue that narratives can be an effective strategy for influencing energy efficiency and comfort, well-being and health. And that opens up possibilities for storytelling as an approach to promote other pro-social behaviours. And we have some evaluation data from our project that suggests this is an effective approach. For example, we pilot tested our narrative videos using cognitive neuroscience techniques. So we actually undertook EEG and eye tracking to see what people's brain and visual response was to showing each video. And we found that these videos effectively influenced people's cognitive engagement. So therefore, at the start of each video, people were paying attention and were actually sort of engaging with the content. We also found that the videos successfully created an emotional response among participants and that their imagination was stimulated. So if you recall, we said that an imaginable plot where you imagine you're walking in the shoes of the person in the story is very important in storytelling. So that was a, a good sign that imagination was engaged here. And importantly, we also found from the EEG research that cognitive and memory processing was happening. So towards the end of each storytelling video, people are processing this information and actually taking it into their memory. And that's very important if we want to um, make sure that that knowledge is then used to influence their future behaviour. In our Energy Plus Illawarra project, we also conducted an extensive evaluation survey um, part of the project, which included a longitudinal cohort survey, including a control group, um, which found that our social marketing programme had a statistically significant and positive influence on participants' attitudes, on their value perceptions towards energy efficiency, their perceived thermal comfort in the home, and also their energy efficiency behaviours. So our social marketing programme did have the desired behaviour change effects. So from this, we would argue that energy researchers, social marketers, policy makers, and social change agents should be encouraged to identify the potential of narratives for influencing behaviour and social change. And if anyone would like to see more information about this project and the various components and research from it, please do feel free to visit the project website, which is www.energyplusillawara.com.au. Thank you, and I'm welcome to uh, take some questions, please. Great. Well, thank you, Ross. And we have some questions uh, already lined up, but feel free, everyone else, if you have a question, put it in. We have a little bit of time still. First off, from Tamara Harbour, 
Um, is there any indication how long the impact of the narrative videos remained with viewers, either in cognitive, emotional engagement, and or energy efficient behaviors? That's a very good question. So with uh, the cognitive neuroscience work, um, there is the opportunity to do follow-up research to actually um, to actually find whether that knowledge has still remained in the person's minds. But you would have to do that using traditional methods, either interviews or survey research. Um, so it, that is a point that we cannot 100% prove that that knowledge remains in the memory. However, what's important is we can, from the EEG research, identify what type of memory processing is happening. So therefore, whether it's short-term memory or long-term memory. And what we found from our EEG research here is that some of the knowledge about how to be energy efficient was actually uh, engaging the parts of the brain that are related to long-term memory processing. So that would suggest that it is going into the long-term memory. However, from our survey evaluation research, we are doing post-intervention follow-up surveys. So we will be able to identify whether some of these knowledge, attitude, and behavior changes are persistent over a longer period of time. Which is a great model for, uh, in terms of um, looking at persistence. So kudos to you for, for doing that. Um, let's see. Can you talk about the relative um, effectiveness of uh, the work you do with narrative videos as compared to other type of social marketing. So you're showing that it's, it's bringing about behavior change. Are you able to compare that with other types of social marketing? Yes, we can look in our evaluation survey. We can identify uh, effect sizes for individual components. Um, however, I would always argue as a strategic social marketer that we should not uh, not always get too focused on individual channels or activities and communications because we know that people are different and different people will respond to different types of activity and intervention. So in our Energy Plus Illawarra project, we purposefully designed a broad toolkit and a broad range of, of activities. So for some participants, the, the energy vi uh, narrative videos will be a, a, a powerful way to influence them. For other people, it may be um, an energy book or it may be a conversation or a home visit that we undertake. So our objective here was to do as many different things with different um, tactics so that we could make sure that there was something for everyone. Um, we did find from our effect size research that the narrative videos for those who had engaged with them and seen them did have a particularly strong impact. But of course, not everyone in our cohort of participants in the project um, actually have seen the videos. Um, it's only a proportion because other people, as I said, prefer other channels of communication. Okay. Um, another question from Tamara. What kind of resources are involved in being able to conduct cognitive neuroscience assessments? Yes, yeah, so um, our, in our project, we actually worked with colleagues down in Melbourne who have got a brain psychology lab. So they basically get people into a laboratory and then they have an EEG cap, which is a, essentially a, a skull cap with various sensors on it that measures their brainwave activity. Um, they also have video recording equipment and eye tracking equipment uh, in the lab, and then a, a com big computer screen which will show the, the videos on the screen. So there are reasonable resources required there. You need to essentially create a laboratory um, environment um, and also have the technologies and the software to analyze that. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily very, very affordable. Um, however, once if you ha are able to link up with a laboratory that does this, running each experiment is no more expensive than running traditional pilot testing. And um, roughly, in, in your estimation, what, what percentage of universities um, would have these kinds of uh, equipment? In Australia, there are only a few universities, perhaps only three or four, that have this equipment. In the United States, in fact, indeed in North America and Europe, I understand that it's more prevalent. So I think cognitive neuroscience labs 
are are are, are you know sort of popping up uh, in an increasing uh, an amount. So I think that there are you know there is reasonable access and it's growing access um, to these to these materials and resources. Um, and actually, if you go on to uh, Google, you can look at the the North American um, Cognitive Neuroscience Association, and they actually have a good um, contact database where you can find what resources and what expertise in your local area is in this area. So they can essentially help you to identify and link up with people who can do this work. Um, question, what does Illawarra mean? Uh, the Illawarra is a region, so it's, a, it's a, basically an area of New South Wales. So it's an area about um, 80 kilometres or about 50 miles south of Sydney um, that stretches right down the coast of New South Wales. So it's the, na it's the name of the local area. Okay, I, was, I think the camera might, might just have wondered if it was based on something, uh, a native word that meant something. Or oh, right, sorry. Yes, I, I understand it's an, an, an indigenous Aboriginal word, but I'm not sure of the meaning. Okay. Um, is there anything else you would talk about in terms of when storytelling would be a good tool to use, particularly good tool to use in social marketing and other times when it maybe wouldn't be the first tool that would come to one's mind? Yeah, good question. So one of the reasons why we wanted to use storytelling here is that energy, is, uh, energy use in the home is not something that people talk about much. Um, it's not something you talk to your friends much about. It's not something even people talk about among their family all that often. Um, because it happens in the home, it tends to be quite private behaviours. So we thought that storytelling is very important in energy because we actually need to get people talking to one another about this. Um, often there are really important insights and knowledge that can be shared. So we, we wanted to, in a sense, create peer-to-peer -peer knowledge uh, creation and sharing from using these storytelling videos. So I would argue that storytelling can certainly be useful in topic areas that are similar, where there's not often a common communication and common uh, talking about um, a, a topic. So perhaps it's taboo, perhaps it's something that people just don't bother to talk about much. And you can try and use storytelling as a way to get people to talk about it. Because stories are such a natural way for us to communicate socially. So if we can embed ideas within these stories, they can then hopefully be retold. Um, in terms of where it may not be more appropriate, um, I guess that's where there may be risks that stories may be reinterpreted the wrong way. So we do need to be mindful of storytelling and how we know stories can be manipulated. Um, for example, you know, the the idea of the concept of Chinese whispers, when the story goes down the line, it completely changes by the time the, the person at the end of the line receives it. So as a social marketer, you need to be aware and, might, and monitor how stories may be retold. And that's something that we still need more research and understanding about. Okay, great. Um, any last uh, word we've got maybe time just for one last piece of advice a common pitfall when doing this kind of work yes um, I think it's it can take time so I think that was the biggest challenge when we put to, we decided we wanted to use storytelling um, we 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 had some background expertise in doing this but not not completely so this was the first time we essentially had put all this together in the one project. Um, and really budgeting enough time and resources is important. Um, creating the videos themselves is very complex. So we had an excellent video producer who worked with us on that. But even, for example, um, you know, formatting the video can take 48 hours to actually process it. So you need to give enough time to actually make changes, to make edits, to, to sort of make sure that the video is all correct. And even things like scripting, um, making sure that the, 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 the wording on the screen, the, the images on the screen, and also the, the audio is all 
and, and shape um, is, is quite challenging. So definitely getting a good video producer and giving yourself enough, yourself enough time to do proper scripting and editing uh, um, is very important. Okay, thank you, Ross. I think with that we're going to have to wrap things up. Uh, really appreciate a very uh, interesting presentation on how to increase impact of our stories through the research and how to actually translate that into how you design the, uh, the communication materials. I think that's really helpful. Thank you also to all the participants in today's webinar. As you leave the webinar, let me see, it's supposed to, there we go. Um, you'll be offered the opportunity to fill out a short evaluation form, and we do depend on your answers when developing our upcoming webinars. So please let us know what's working for you and what you'd like us to do differently in the future. Our next webinar coming up in the series is In Motion, Using Community-Based Social Marketing to Reduce Driving and Greenhouse Gas Emissions with Sunny Knott from King County Metro, Tuesday, September 27th. This is a, a case study that was recently designated a landmark best-in-class a case study by the Tools of Change Peer Selection Panel in Energy Efficiency. Um, learn how community-based social marketing techniques persuaded nearly 20,000 Seattle area travelers to drive less. Finally, thanks to Wynn, who's helped make these webinars an important part of ISMA's member offerings. Wynn, over to you. He may still be on uh, mute. When are you on mute? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm still here, Jay. You can, can you hear, hear you me? Now. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, and if, if you could just uh, forward the slide for me, I'd sure appreciate that. Oh, <laughs> certainly. It's not working for me uh, right now. Okay. And it's my technical difficulties, but it really, like I said before, Jay, it's, it's a pleasure to be uh, part of the, all of your webinars. And you make it seem really easy, but I know you're spending a lot of time on it, a lot of your volunteer time organizing it. And I want you to know how much all of us, the participants, the speakers, and the organization really appreciate what you're doing. And Ross, hey, thank you for the presentation, Narrative Practices thank in you. Social Marketing. Yeah, I, I learned a lot, and it, it, it's, uh, it's really good to see that the, the idea of storytelling coming into different areas and, uh, than reproductive health like we, we uh, used to see before. And we love the idea of the, uh, the cognitive neuroscience coming in. Uh, quite exciting, I think. A real advance in social marketing, we, we all think. And to our members and participants today in today's webinar, I want to thank you for your continued support and your participation. Hey, hope to see you all at the uh, In Motion Using Community-Based Social Marketing to Reduce Driving and Greenhouse Gas Emissions with Sunny Knott in September 27th and 28th. Until then, keep visiting the ISMA website, share your events on our calendar, and exchange resources, and keep up with our Career Center. Until then, this is the International Social Marketing Association. We now conclude today's webinar.